decade, it was before I, way before I joined IEC and was still a student in those days. But um, I think when they were discussing this criterion, they, they wanted a criterion that specifically looked at um, very small populations occurring in areas where one event could just wipe them out quite quickly. So they had these three scenarios with the three thresholds and um, thought, okay, that will do. But then, of course, somebody brought, brings up the idea of island endemics, which maybe the population size is bigger, but it's got very restricted range. So this is why they ended up with this vulnerable D2, because they discussed scenarios of what if you have a restricted range but no threats, then it's not really threatened. Or what if you have a restricted range and no threats at the moment, but there's plausible threats there, which could one day in the near future make that species critically endangered or even extinct in a very, very short time period. So they ended up with this criterion D2 scenario. Um, so th those are basically the rules then. So small population size use D or D1 for vulnerable. Um, and if you have a highly restricted range, typically less than 20 square kilometers for the area of occupancy, or typically less than five locations, or five locations or less. And emphasizing the word typically here because this is just a suggestion. It's not a very strict threshold. If it occurs in six locations, you can, and there's a threat there that's highly restricted, you can still use vulnerable due to. If it occurs in 30 square kilometers in an area where there's a plausible threat, likely to hit it any time, you use, use vulnerable due to. If you, does this mean that the patient is still less than that? Yes. Oh, no, no, sorry, sorry, no. The D1 and D2 are not linked. Your population so you size. Have, you have a million of them, they're in this. Oh, crowded, extremely small area, you could, yeah. If there's a plausible threat. If it's in an area where there are no threats at all, island endemic, mountain endemic, of a species that's actually not going to pop away because of climate change, another issue, but <laughs> um, then you would assess it as a concern because there's, no, there's nothing affecting it. It's not likely to go extinct within the next you know, two or three generations. Um, that's fine. But if there is something that is very likely to hit it at any point, unpredictably, um, the, the example I gave earlier on was um, invasive species marching sort of slowly down the archipelago of islands. So the, the population at the end is one day going to be hit by this search of invasive species, unless something is done to stop that, then you would use vulnerable D2. Okay. And that's just saying the same thing. Um, we have got a couple of examples in here. I'm not sure if we need to go to them, but okay. One example, you have species in this case a fish that lives in one lake where the area of occupancy is about 22 square kilometers, so it's just outside that typical threshold. The population is currently stable. Um, there are no current threats, but they've got this invasive species problem in near, nearby lakes, so there's a very real plausible threat there. So you would use vulnerable D2. The other example is what I was saying before. If you have a, a, a very restricted um, area of occupancy in a number of locations, population not declined, but there are absolutely no threats that we know of that are likely to hit this species in the near future, then you would use least concern. And you would document it, you'd support why you'd use least concern. Any questions on criterion E? Okay, criterion E is extremely straightforward. Criterion E is based purely on quantitative analysis, and this is exactly as Rebecca had explained earlier on today. Um, quantitative analysis, for example, a population viability analysis, but it doesn't have to be restricted to that. It could be any kind of analysis where you've created a, pop a model which predicts the uh, probability of extinction within a certain time frame in the future. So obviously there are going to be some major assumptions in that model. Any population viability analysis does have major assumptions and you can actually modify the data to suit your own needs in a way. You can do, run different scenarios and choose the one that best suits. Um, 
So any time criterion E is actually used on the red list, and it's rarely used, it is used, but it's very rare, we always ask that the, the assumptions that were built into the model, and if possible, the analysis itself gets sent to us along with the assessment, so that we can we would then forward that onto the standards subcommittee, and they would look at it and, and judge whether it's actually been applied appropriately for the, the red list criteria. It's very straightforward. You have um, an analysis, and if your analysis shows that there's at least 50% probability of your species becoming extinct within 10 years or three generations, it is critically endangered. If the, prob if the model shows that there's at least 20% probability of going extinct within 20 years or five generations, then it's endangered. And 10% within 100 years, it's vulnerable. And again, we, we put this time cap of 100 years in the future. We're, we're not expecting models to say, yes, in 5,000 years, this species will be extinct. Well, we might be extinct by then, who knows? <laughs> you can tell. OK, any questions at the moment? Need an exercise? Right. Um, could you go, go through? You're very familiar with this information now. We would just like you to. Finish off your assessment, do your assessment under criteria C, D and E, and then we'll come back and go through the answers to those. Again, 15 minutes please.